Mr. Brian, I want to thank you, say thank you for fighting for me. Thank you for caring about me. I love you all for trying to save me. When I hung up on the phone that night, I had a wet face and a broken heart. The lack of compassion I witnessed every day had finally exhausted me. I looked around my crowded office at the stats, stacks of records and papers, each pile full of tragic stories, and I suddenly didn't want to be surrounded by all this anguish and misery. As I sat there, I thought to myself, I thought myself a fool for having tried to fix situations that were so fatally broken. It's time to stop. I can't do this anymore. For the first time in my life, I realized that my life was just full of brokenness. I worked in a broken system of justice. My clients were broken by mental illness, poverty, and racism. They were torn, about, torn apart by disease, drugs and alcohol, pride, fear, and anger. I thought of Joe Sullivan and Trina, Antonio, Ian, and the dozens of other broken children we worked with, struggling to survive in prison. I thought of people broken by war, like Herbert Richardson, people broken by poverty, like Marsha Colby, Pifin people broken by disability like Avery Jenkins. In their broken state, they were judged and condemned by people whose commitment to fairness had been broken by cynicism, hopelessness, and prejudice. I looked at my computer and at the calendar on the wall. I looked again around my office at the stacks of the files. I saw the list of our staff, which had grown to nearly 40 people. And before I knew it, I was talking to myself out loud. I can just leave. Why am I doing this? It took me a while to sort it out, but I realized something sitting there while Jimmy Dale was being killed at home in prison. After working for more than 25 years, I understand that I don't do what I do because it's required or necessary or important. I don't do it because I have no choice. I do what I do because I'm broken too. My years of struggling against inequality, abusive power, poverty, oppression, and injustice had finally revealed something to me about myself. Being close to suffering, death, and executions, and cruel punishment didn't just illuminate the brokenness of others. In a moment of anguish and heartbreak, it also exposed my brokenness. You can't effectively fight abusive power, poverty, inequality, illness, oppression, or injustice and not be broken by it. We are all broken by something. We have all hurt someone and have been hurt. We all share the condition of brokenness, even if our brokenness is not equivalent. I desperately wanted mercy for Jimmy Dill and would have done anything to create justice for him. But I couldn't pretend that his struggle was disconnected from my own. The ways in which I've been hurt and have hurt others are different from the ways Jimmy Dill suffered and caused suffering, but our shared brokenness connected us. Paul Farmer, the renowned physician who had spent his life trying to cure the world's sickest and poorest people, once quoted me something that the writer Thomas Merton said. We are bodies of broken bones. I guess I'd always known but never fully considered that being broken is what makes us human. We all have our reasons. Sometimes we're fractured by the choices we make. Sometimes we're shattered by things we would have never chosen. But our brokenness is also the source of our common humanity, the basis of our shared search for comfort, meaning, and healing. Our shared vulnerability and imperfect imperfection nurtures and sustains our capacity for compassion. We have a choice. We can embrace our humanness, which means embracing our broken natures and the compassion that remains our best hope for healing. Or we can deny our brokenness, for, forswear compassion, and as a result, deny our huma humanity. I thought of the guards dropping Jimmy Dale to the gurney that very hour. I thought of the people who would cheer his death and see it as some kind of victory. I realized they were broken people too, even if they would never admit it. So many of us have become afraid and angry. We've become so fearful and vengeful that we've thrown away children, discarded the disabled, and sanctioned the imprisonment of the sick and the weak. Not because they are the threat to public safety or beyond re rehabilitation, but because we think it makes us seem tough, less broken. I thought of the victims of violent crime and the survivors of murdered loved ones and how we've pressured them to recycle their pain and anguish and give it back to the offenders we prosecute. I thought of the many ways we've legalized vengeful and cruel punishments, how we've allowed our victimization to justify the victimization of others. We've submitted to the harsh instinct to crush those among us whose brokenness is most visible. By simply punishing the broken, walking away from them or hiding them from sight only ensures that they remain broken, and we do too. There is no wholesome, wholeness outside of our reciprocal humanity. 
I frequently had difficult conversations with clients who were struggling and despairing over their situations, over the things they had done or had been done to them that led them to painful moments. Whenever things got really bad and they were questioning the value of their lives, I'd remind them that each of us is more than the worst things we've ever done. I told them that if someone tells a lie, that person is not just a liar. If you take someone that does, take something that doesn't belong to you, you are not just a thief. Even if you kill someone, you are not just a killer. I told myself that evening what I had been telling my clients for years. I am more than broken. In fact, there is a strength, a power even, in understanding brokenness. Because embracing our brokenness creates a need to desire for mercy and perhaps a corresponding need to show mercy. When you experience mercy, you learn things that are hard to learn otherwise. You see things you can't otherwise see. You hear things you can't otherwise hear. You been, begin to recognize the humanity that resides in each of us. All of a sudden, I felt stronger. I began thinking about what would happen if we all just acknowledged our brokenness. If we owned up to our weaknesses, our deficits, our biases, and our fears. Maybe if we did, we won't, wouldn't want to kill the broken among us who have killed others. Maybe we would look harder for solutions to caring for the disabled, the abused, the neglected, and the traumatized. I had a, no a notion that if we acknowledge our brokenness, we can no longer take pride in mass, mass incarceration and in executing people in our deliberate indifference to the most vulnerable. When I was a college student, I had a job working at a, as a musician <clears throat> in a black church in a poor section of West Philadelphia. At a certain point in the service, I would play the organ before the choir began to sing. The minister would stand, spread his arms wise, wide, and say, Make me hear the joy and gladness, and the bones which thou had broken my, may rejoice. I never fully appreciated what he was saying until the night Jimmy Dill was executed. I had the privilege of meeting Rosa Parks when I first moved to Montgomery. She would occasionally come back to Montgomery from Detroit, where she lived, to visit dear friends. Johnny Carr was one of those friends. Miss Carr had befriended me, and I quickly learned that she was a force of nature, charismatic, powerful, and inspiring. She had been, in many ways, the true architect of the Montgomery bus boycott. She had organized people and transportation during the boycott and had done a lot of heavy lifting to make it the first successful major action of the modern civil rights movement. And she succeeded Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. She was in her late 70s when I first met her. Now, Brian, I'm going to call you from time to time, and I'm going to ask you to do this or that, and when I ask you to do something, you're going to say, yes, ma'am, okay? I chuckled, and I said, yes, ma'am. She would sometimes call just to check on me, and on occasion, she would invite me over when Miss Parks came to town. Brian, Rosa Parks is coming to town, and we're going to meet over at Virginia Durr's house to talk. Do you want to come over and listen? Ugh, imagine being a fly on the wall. When Miss Carr called me, she either wanted me to go someplace to speak or to go someplace to listen. Whenever Miss Parks came to town, I'd be invited to listen. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'd love to come over and listen, I'd always say, affirming that I understood what to do when I arrived. Miss Parks and Miss Carr would meet at Virginia Durr's home. Miss Durr was also a larger than life personality. Her husband, Clifford Durr, was an attorney who had represented Dr. King throughout his time in Montgomery. Miss Durr was determined to confront injustice well into her 90s. She frequently asked me to accompany her to various places or invited me over to dinner. EJI started renting her home for a new law student for our, our law students and staff during the summers when she was away. When I would go over to Miss Dunn's home, Oops, Miss Durr's home to listen to these three formidable women, Rosa Parks was always very kind and generous with me. Years later, I would occasionally meet her at events in other states, and I ended up spending a little time with her. But mostly, I just loved hearing her and Miss Carr and Miss Durr talk. They would talk and talk and talk, laughing, telling stories, and bearing witness about what could be done when people stood up or sat down in Miss Parks' case. They're always so spirited together. Even after all they've done, their focus was always on what they still plan to do for civil rights. The first time I met Miss Parks, I sat on Miss Durr's front porch in Old Cloverdale, a residential neighborhood in Montgomery, and I listened to the three women talk for hours. Finally, after watching me listen for all that time, Miss Parks turned to me and sweetly asked, Now, Brian, tell me who you are and what you're doing. I looked at Miss Carr to see if I had permission to speak, and she smiled and nodded at me. 
I then gave Miss Parks my wrap. Yes, ma'am. Well, I have a law project called the Equal Justice Initiative, and we're trying to help people on death row. We're trying to stop the death penalty, actually. We're trying to do something about prison conditions and excessive punishment. We want to free people who've been wrongfully convicted. We want to end unfair sentences in criminal cases and stop racial bias in criminal justice. We're trying to help the poor and do something about indignant defense and the fact that we don't, that people don't get to le the legal help they need. We're trying to help people who are mentally ill. We're trying to stop them from putting children in adult jails and prisons. We're trying to do something about poverty and hopelessness that dominates poor communities. We want to see more diversity in decision-making roles in the justice system. We're trying to educate people about racial history and the need for racial justice. We're trying to confront abuse of power by police and prosecutors. I realized that had gone on way too long and I stopped abruptly. Ms. Parks, Ms. Carr, and Ms. Durr were all looking at me. Ms. Parks leaned back, smiling, Oh, honey, all that's going to make you tired, tired, tired. We all laughed. I looked down, a little embarrassed. Then Miss Carr leaned forward and put her finger in my face and talked to me like a grandmother. my grandmother used to talk to me. She said, that's why you've just got to be brave, brave, brave. All th three women nodded in silent agreement, and for just a little while, they made me feel like a young prince. I looked at the clock. It was 6.30 p.m. Mr. Dill was dead by now. I was very tired and it was time to stop all this foolishness about quitting. It was time to be brave. I turned to my computer and there was an email inviting me to speak to students in a poor school district about remaining hopeful. The teacher told me that she heard me speak and wanted me to be a role model for the students and inspire them to do great things. Sitting in my office, drying my tears, reflecting on my brokenness, it seemed like a laughable notion. But then I thought about those kids and the overwhelming and unfair challenges that too many children in this country have to overcome. And I started typing a message saying that I'd be honored to come. On the drive home, I turned on the car radio, seeking news about Mr. Dill's execution. I found the station airing a news report. It was a local religious station, but in their news broadcast, there was no mention of execution. I left the station on, and before long, a preacher began a sermon. She started with the scripture, Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that a power of Christ may work through me. Since I know it's all for God, Christ's good, I'm quite content with the weaknesses and with insults, hardships, prosecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I turned off the radio station, and as I slowly made my way home, I understood that even as if we are caught, if we are caught in a web of hurt and brokenness, we're also in a web of healing and mercy. I thought of the little boy who hugged me outside of church, creating reconciliation and love. I didn't deserve reconciliation or love in that moment, but that's not how mercy works. But that's how mercy works. The power of just mercy is that it belongs to the undeserving. It's when mercy is least expected that it's most potent. Strong enough to break the cycle of victimization and victimhood, retribution and suffering, is the power to heal the psychic harm and injuries that lead to aggression and violence and abuse of power, mass incarceration. I drove home broken and brokenhearted about Jimmy Dill, but I knew I would come back the next day. There was more work to do.